Hey guys, it's Michael with Engadget, and we're here with Mark Satrakian, the creator and builder of the robots on the Robot Combat League. So thanks for being with us, Mark. My pleasure. So my first question is, um, how did you get involved with Robot Combat League, and why fighting robots? Well, fighting robots, obviously, are awesome. Fair enough. And I was contacted initially because uh, many different paths of fighting robots have, I've, I have followed, and they kind of lead back to me. I was the heavyweight champion of Robot Wars. I'm a seven-time giant nut winner at BattleBots. And I also build giant mechanical creatures for movies for a living. So it, it seemed like a good fit. Okay, so obviously, you know, you're familiar with building giant, moving, realistically moving things. But yeah. fighting robots are a little bit different. I assume they have to be quite a bit more robust and be able to deal with things. So can you talk a little bit about just the, the challenges of building combat robots versus, you know, animatronics for movies? That's a really good question because they're totally different. A movie set is a, a pretty friendly environment. You know, everyone's there to, to, to support the illusion. The combat arena is a very, very unfriendly environment. So these things had to be able to, to march on the floor, they had to hold their own weight, they had to be able to, to throw a punch and also take a punch. For me, the part of, of the movie making experience that I have that I brought to this was the puppeteering aspect of it. Because the robo jockeys are in these suits, these exosuits, and they're controlling the robot in this very naturalistic way. That part is the part that I brought from the movies, and the, the holding up under battle part is the part that I brought from BattleBots and Robot Wars. So, so let's, let's kind of break it up into two then. So was it challenging for you to build the exosuits and the controls, or was this pretty much a direct translation from what you'd done previously? No, this has never really been done like this before. Uh, there, was a, there was definitely a big challenge of building a machine that, that couldn't just move around, but could actually deliver a, a, a death blow to another machine. That was really tough. The hard part is that you know it's going to break. It's going to break somewhere, and we're going to have to fix these things in between rounds. We have like this mash unit that, that comes in and works on the robots when they're broken. And being able to fix them was actually part of the design process. Okay, so let's just talk about it for folks that, that weren't aware. The, can you just talk a little bit about a, how the combat actually works and, and the mechanics of it? The, I know that there's multiple rounds with the fixing, so can you just talk a little bit about that? Uh, you want to talk about... The so just, the just the mechanics. So the robots fight, then they have a break, and you're responsible for fixing them in between rounds, yeah, correct? That's right. So, so, so I guess how many times you have to fix them? How do you just determine what to fix? I'm assuming 20 minutes. It's not a lot yeah, of time. Yeah. So we have 20 minutes to fix the robots. And when, when the robot comes out of the arena, I have to look at it very quickly and figure out what's broken, what can be fixed, what can't be fixed. Can it even be put back into the arena again? Because usually it's squirting hydraulic fluid, which is hot, by the way. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's kind of nasty. So we figure out, OK, what can we fix? What can we, what can we pull out and replace? What can we fix in place? In some cases, uh, I started actually pulling pieces out of the robots and welding them right there and then sticking them back in again while they were still smoking hot. And then that 20 minutes comes up, and you've got to get it back in the ring. I got you. OK, so let's talk a little bit about this. I know, um, so we at Engadget, we're usually dealing with, I guess, kind of autonomous standalone robots that run on battery power, yeah. you know, or, or those kinds of things. These are a very different creature, correct? Yeah, that's right. These things are, they're hydraulic. And the power supply that they're hooked up to is like, it's like this V8. It is a, it is a 2,000 PSI, 50 gallon per minute hydraulic pump. Now, to give you some perspective, uh, for example, Boston Dynamics has an incredible robot called Petman. You guys have probably seen that. Yes. That thing runs at about 7 GPM, 7 gallons per minute. The Robot Combat League robots are running at 50 gallons per minute. So that, all of that extra energy is going into mashing the other robot. It has to have this ridiculous amount of power. And I knew going into it that it, it couldn't be self-contained. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is I have to have this incredible power, but I also have to be able to turn them off because during the, the breaks, you know, when the, when the round is over, the first thing we do is run in and stick our hands in these things. And if they were full of fuel or had, you know, LiPo batteries in there, it would be extremely dangerous. So, so that's the main thing. I guess with these, how has the season been going? How have the robots been performing? Is there anything you would have liked to have done differently seeing how they've... I guess, reacted in, in a combat arena. Yeah, so uh, I wouldn't have changed anything for season one. I'm already thinking about season two, so there's definitely changes for season two. But for the season one robots, I think that 
the balance of the system worked out pretty well. People say, well, the arms seem like a, like a weak point because the arms break, or the torso seems like a weak point because the torsos break, but the arms are getting hit and the torso is getting hit. It's actually breaking where it's getting hit, which frankly makes sense. Yeah. So I really wouldn't have changed any of that. Um, I would probably, uh, uh, no, I wouldn't change anything, no. Okay, okay, so in, in the process of the design process, I understand you built a prototype, took you about four months, and then you built I guess all the 12 the more twelve robots more robots in, in another four months. Yeah. yeah right. Okay. So, in the process, can you talk a little bit about the the design process? How you came up with that that initial prototype? Like, how did you go about constructing it? Were there multiple failures and issues as you were going along? Right. So four months. If you've ever built anything like an eight foot tall hydraulic robot, four months is really not enough time to do that. So I started out with a sketch. I drew a little sketch of you know the rough proportions of the thing, and then I just started I just started building. Uh, I did a model in Inventor, and I, oh God, I, I didn't have time for failure. I didn't have time for a second chance. I basically put everything I had into this prototype and built it, and then when the day came, we fired it up, and God damn it, it worked. Yeah. So was this something that you had designed? Did, did you do any design process with like AutoCAD or anything like this, or was it straight grabbing parts, putting no, no. them on there? The whole, the whole thing, as much as possible, the whole thing exists as a exists as a CAD model. Now the CAD model evolves as you're building it, but you have to have a detailed CAD model when you're making something like this because it, it, it gives you the ability to predict where failures are gonna occur. It gives you the ability to predict where things are gonna crash into each other. And it really comes back to not having the time to build parts twice. And at that scale, rebuilding a, a leg or an arm, that's a big commitment. So when, when you are putting these pieces together, I'm assuming there's, so, there's a lot of off-the-shelf hydraulic rams and stuff that you use within it. How much of it was those kinds of things and how much of it was custom-built stuff that you had to fabricate on your own? So the, uh, the hydraulic actuators and the valves are things that I can get off the shelf. It's a very high shelf, though, and it takes about eight weeks to get that stuff. So they are actually custom-made for me. The arms and legs, the, the shells, every other single piece of the robot was custom fabricated. I gotcha. And were you doing this yourself, everything, or did you have like a team or some other folks helping you out? Uh, for the first three months, I was doing it by myself. And then in the last month, I brought in my kind of my key guys to help me out with the electronics and the control system and, and just to plow through just a, a mountain of CNC machining that had to be done to make that thing work. So was it more difficult doing the, I guess, the physical building? Or I assume there's got to be some, some programming and everything involved to, to have the systems functioning properly. The, the design process was actually really stressful because I knew I wasn't going to be able to redo it. I had to have it work the first time. So I was really, really stressed out and started building as I was designing. Uh, the software control, I, I sometimes write my own control software, but this time I used uh, an off-the-shelf, somewhat off-the-shelf control system called Overdrive, which is used for feature films. And that gave me 90% of what I needed. And then it has a plug-in architecture. So I have a custom plug-in. So I've got guys writing the plug-in. I've got uh, I've got welders, these hot riders in Chatsworth who are doing all the TIG welding of the stainless steel for the skin. I've got, you know, my, my dear friend running my CNC machine all night long, and that's how I pulled it off. Very cool. Um, so I guess my, my only other question is, when you're doing this, you're, you're pulling a lot from your movie experience, yeah. but these kind of seem like robust systems. Was there ever any input from, you know, I'm thinking like robot arms that are putting together cars and things like that. Did you pull anything from that or was this strictly from, from your mind and movies? No, it's really strictly from my mind, but it's not just the movies. The, the, the robot combat experience from BattleBots and Robot Wars was key to this because you hear it all the time. I didn't know that could happen. I didn't know that could break. And I've, I've worked with industrial robot arms before, and they're fantastic if you always use them within spec. Nothing about Robot Combat League is within spec. It's all out of spec. Warranty void. That should be the, that should be the slogan. So is there going to be any application for what you've learned here? Is there going to be any branching out beyond maybe purely entertainment? Will we ever see any of what you've learned with combat? Obviously, these robust systems have to have perhaps interest from the military, other places. Like, have you... Have you thought about that? Has anyone contacted well, you about it? Uh, actually, I've been working on a bomb squad robot for a while, okay. and that's, um, it's, it's not like the Robot Combat League robots at all, mm -hmm. but some of the ideas are the same, um, which is to say the control is very fluid control. Uh, that, that part, I think, is definitely going to find its way into, into the world, um, but the giant robots that can destroy thing part, I don't think that belongs in the real world. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, so I know we've got something you can't really tell us. Can you give us anything about what's going to happen 
Any any little hint about the the improvements you'll make for next season? Oh, oh, for next season, oh, I can't tell you anything about that. Um, I mean, this season isn't even over yet. Um, uh, I will tell you that the 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 final the final fight, the championship match of Robot Combat League, is ridiculous. Uh, a lot of people say, Mark, God, you must be really bummed out when you see the robots getting getting destroyed on the show. And honestly, it's not like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, when those robots go in and start fighting, I am I am jumping up and down. I am screaming. And that that last night was just unbelievable. Right on. Well, thank you very much. That's all we have for now. We'll see you guys next time. Yeah.